Welcome to Kevin Deal Photography, where I take you on my journey through photography. On today's episode, we're going to be doing my long-term review and thoughts on the Fuji GFX 100S. I'm pleased to announce that I'm launching three Capture One style packs, Metamorphic Portraits, The Sound of Silver, and Rangefinder. These will eventually also be available for Lightroom, so if you go to kevindealphotography.com, scroll to the bottom of the homepage, and join my mailing list, I promise I won't send you spam, but I will let you know the second these release. And now, on to today's episode. The allure of medium format. That beautiful 3 by 4 aspect ratio. The ability to discern small details from greater distances. It beckons many, myself included. 100 megapixels. Dynamic range for miles. Ibis. those well-known Fuji colors and film simulations. Phase detect autofocus. What's it like to spend over two years with the GFX 100S? The list of sensors that you could argue are better than the GFX 100S is a very short list. These specifications, no doubt, look amazing on paper, but how good are they in practice? How good is the GFX 100S as a practical, everyday camera? Especially considering that there's a new one out. We attempt to find out the answer to that in today's episode. Welcome to today's episode. If you're not familiar with Kevin Deal Photography, we do gear reviews tips, techniques, and tutorials, and sometimes we dive into film. If any of that sounds appealing to you, click the subscribe button below. So about two years ago, I went on a quest to find the ultimate camera in terms of image quality. Uh, I already owned a Canon R5, and I love my R5, but uh, from an artistic standpoint, the colors left me wanting a little bit more. So I was led down the rabbit hole of Fuji GFX, which is probably why a lot of you are here right now. And I saw that there was a GFX 50R and that they made a new version of the 50. Uh, I saw that they had the 100, uh, which was a very large and very expensive camera. And so uh, with my research, I uh, settled, I say settled, I decided on the 100S because at the time, two years ago, it looked like the perfect camera for me. And I've used it extensively on my personal and some commercial work, and I have thoughts on it. So if you came to today's review, to this video, hoping that I was gonna go take it out and do a bunch of tests on it and all that, this is not that review. Um, I do those real world reviews, but I haven't done that real world review on this guy. I just kind of couldn't get around to it. And now enough time has elapsed. And then there's a new model that has come out, the GFX 100 Mark II. And so I just kind of skipped it. And instead, I'm just going to do my long-term review. So we're not going to be doing tests. We're not going to be taking pictures of charts. We're not going to be taking it out on vacation and all that. We're going to look at my body of work that I've done on it. And then I'm going to tell you what met my expectations, what exceeded my expectations, and what fell short of my expectations. So 
I may uh, put up a stat about the camera as I talk about it, but I'm not going to go through the list of things. And I might as well get another thing out of the way right now is we're not going to focus on video at all because in all honesty, for a $6,500 camera body, you can go buy Sony FX, you can go buy a Canon R5C, heck, you can buy a Canon Cinema Series uh, body for less than this camera. And if I were going to primarily focus on video, I would go get one of those over this because that's not really what this guy does. This is a fine art commercial stills camera and it does do video well. I actually shot video on it twice and both times it looked very beautiful, but that's just not why you get this camera. So we are focusing on stills. So let's talk about the primary reason why the majority of you are here and that is image quality. On my very first shoot, I took a model to the Colorado River here in Austin, and what immediately stood out to me is, had I taken some of these shots with my Canon R5, when I was looking at the water, uh, it would have rendered what was under the water as just black. It would have rendered the shadow black. And what I immediately noticed with my GFX 100S, that there was actually like an aquamarine color under the water that this sensor went in and penetrated and brought in. Immediately it made an impact and I was like, okay, this was a good investment. So if you're on the fence about, oh, how good is the sensor on this? It's a damn fine sensor and it's going to be better than 99.99999% of you out there are ever going to need. Uh, if you take a bad picture with dynamic range with this camera, it's because you're not a good photographer and you don't know how to expose a picture properly because I've actually accidentally uh, taken a shot that was five or six stops underexposed with this guy because when you're in the studio, you turn off exposure simulation or preview because you need the image to be as bright as it can be because the camera can't predict what your flash is going to do. And then right as soon as I finished that studio session, I asked the model, hey, can we just go outside real quick and take a couple of pictures? I wanted to test something out. And I forgot to turn that mode off. And of course, my brain is going, oh, these pictures look perfectly exposed. And I shot them and I took them into post-production. And I was like, oh my gosh, these are massively underexposed. I pulled up the brightness and the shadows and the exposure. And it was perfectly fine for posting on Instagram and all that. Maybe that recovery wasn't good enough to do a fine art print at close distances, but it was pretty much good enough for everything else. So that and the example with the water told me that this camera is a serious force in terms of dynamic range. And I mean, just looking at my work in that slideshow, I think that you can see that there are just some gorgeous colors. The other place where this sensor really shined was in low lighting situations where I had to bump up that ISO. There were some projects that I tested out high ISO on, and boy, that sensor gathered quite a bit of light, and I was very impressed with the results that I got. Fuji has a fantastic reputation for sensors, for color science. Uh, now you couple that with a 100 megapixel sensor, medium format, and yeah, it's, it's heaven, man. The image quality on this is top notch. That is one of the things that no matter how much that rabbit hole I went down until I experienced what kind of images I could take with this guy, uh, there's really not words that can really uh, describe the experience of shooting on the camera in terms of what you capture. Uh, when you nail on this camera, it is portfolio material and it is artistic and it is absolutely stunning. Uh, in terms of ergonomics, I think the ergonomics on it are fine. I wish they had implemented a directional pad, but in general, the things that I need to get to quickly are on the back, are accessible. And so for that, I'll give a Fuji a, a kind of a half a notch there, a half a, half a point, because I feel like that this area right here, man, look at all that real estate that they could have put more buttons on. And since this is a premium camera being sold to a premium photographer, so to speak, I think that they should have had premium ergonomics by putting something like a directional pad on there. So I do think that that was a missed opportunity from Fuji. The internal image stabilization was welcome. You can get uh, slightly better handheld shots than you could before. And my experience has reflected that. They added a film simulation to this guy, Nostalgic Negative. Now they have a new film simulation on the new uh, GFX 100 Mark II, but that's the only real difference between this guy and the new one in terms of film simulations is that there's one more film simulation hardly worth spending several thousand dollars on. The battery uses that NPW235, uh, the same one that I use on my X-H2. Maybe you're an X-T4 user, maybe you're an X-T5 user, you use the X-H2S. That is welcome because the older batteries for uh, 
for Fuji were pretty terrible. I'll put the shot count below, but in the two years I've owned this camera, I think I've only run down the battery once and I tend to take two or three batteries with me on a shoot. So battery life has never been a problem. I should also say that you slow down with this camera. You shoot slower on the Fuji GFX. Some of that is because the camera is just slower. Uh, some of it is the fact that you probably have a hard drive uh, anxiety because every time you push the shutter release uh, and you shoot at that full uncompressed raw, you get like a 202 megabyte file. So that's something to keep in mind. You do need a lot of hard drive space or just take less shots. And I actually think that that has been uh, one of the positives about the experience of shooting on the Fuji GFX is it is a slower camera, which is a negative in some ways, but in other respects, it makes you slow down. It makes you shoot with intention. It makes you pay more attention to your framing, almost like you're shooting on film. Uh, when I shoot on medium format and I do the math in my head, oh, it's $2 every time I push the shutter release because of the processing and all that. That's the anxiety that that gives me. This one is simply hard drive anxiety. Of course, you can delete things. Uh, but just something to keep in mind is that if you are considering this camera, it is a slower camera. If you want to go up there like with a Canon R5, like when I go shoot with my Canon R5, I just hold down back button focus. It follows the eye. I go bang, bang, bang. I shoot shots out. Life is good. To a lesser extent, I do that with my X-H2. That is not the experience you're going to get shooting on a GFX 100S. It's more like line up the shot. Okay. Hold steady and click. Okay, now I'm gonna line up the shot again and click. That's about how fast you would shoot with this camera. That's the fastest I shoot with this camera. So that's something to keep in mind is that it is not a fast process and that has some positive and some negative aspects to it. In terms of lenses, the GFX system does offer a decent amount of lenses, less lenses than a lot of other systems you're used to, but with it being a niche system, you really have to have realistic expectations. The lenses do roll out slowly for the system, but there is a decent lens lineup. Some of my favorites are the 110, the 63, and the 45. I did address the fact that the lenses do roll out slowly for the system, and so a lot of GFX owners have taken matters into their own hands, and there's a big culture now of people who adapt vintage lenses. I myself have done that and made videos on it. I've adapted Canon EF lenses, Minolta lenses, Hasselblad lenses, and gargantuan Mamiya RB67 lenses. The results are mixed, but coupled with those beautiful Fuji film simulations, you can get some unique results, everything ranging from interesting color casts to star-shaped bouquet. You simply go out and purchase an adapter from companies like KNF and Photo Deox, you match it up to your GFX, and you're good to go. In most cases, that comes with a caveat of manual focus. Speaking of focus, the big elephant in the room with this guy is autofocus. One of the things that caused me to pull the trigger on it is that they implemented phase detect autofocus. And I knew going in that it was going to be a slower process, but even knowing all that, it's still pretty disappointing. Now I do know that these large medium format lenses on this large medium format sensor require more processing. The glass is larger and therefore it needs larger motors to move. There's a lot of stuff going against you when you shoot on this camera. And then in the studio, another big negative aspect is that the shutter sync speed is 1 1 25th of a second. We'll get into that later, but the, the key word is slow and slow isn't necessarily compatible with things that move fast. So uh, when I shoot models, they tend to want to flow pose. They tend to get into a groove, right? They're getting into a rhythm when they're shaping their body for the camera. They see the flash bulb go off, they go to the next pose. This camera has a hell of a time keeping up with a well-seasoned model who's in a groove. It just isn't that kind of camera. And so that's something to keep in mind if you're looking at this as maybe a fashion photographer. Now, I do shoot some fashion on this, and the fashion I shoot on this is absolutely breathtakingly stunning. But that is with a caveat that the model has to change the way that they work. I can't have models moving around, which sometimes is their preferred way to get into their groove. You do not get to do that with this camera. So when I have a model who I've never worked with with this camera before, I go, hey, this camera is a very slow camera. So you got to get into a pose and hold it and then wait for the flash bulb and then get into another pose and then hold for a long time wait for the flash bulb. It's not going to be as fast of a rhythm as you're probably used to. So as long as you know that going in and you have that conversation 
with the model, you should be fine. That being said, you're still going to miss 10 to 15 and sometimes up to 20% of your shots depending on how nice your modeling lamp is in your studio and how well the, the focusing is on this. So even though this is phase detect autofocus, not contrast based autofocus, it is still incredibly slow to the point where if you've never shot on this camera before, it's going to probably come across as a bit of a shock to you unless you're just a film shooter. If the autofocus on the 100S is disappointing to you and a deal breaker for you, but you still wanna take advantage of that beautiful sensor, I recommend you save up a little bit more money and check out the GFX 100 Mark II. One thing that may disappoint you, it did not disappoint me because I knew it going in, and I didn't purchase it for this reason, is the five frames per second with mechanical shutter. Five frames per second is like film speed slow. It's pretty darn slow. And so that's something to keep in mind is that you're not purchasing this camera for speed. I think that's a recurring theme that you're hopefully getting by this point in the video. One more commentary on how slow this camera is. The shutter sync speed is 1 1 25th of a second. You may be thinking, who cares? You're in the studio. Well, when I'm on a set and I am operating with a team of people, I have to have my house lights on. I don't prefer to work with my house lights on. And when it's me and just a model, I tend to turn my house lights off and then I just use my modeling lamps. However, for safety reasons, if I have a stylist and a makeup artist and a, and a hairstylist and a model or two or three models running around my set, having the house lights off can be hazardous. So I have to have them on. Well, if I'm not shooting at f11 or f8, and I'm a little bit more wide open than that, you can have ambient light creep into your image. And that's obviously bad because it'll have color casts, it'll make your white balance look all screwed up. And so having that slow 1 1 25th shutter speed, that is very slow. Like all my cameras are in that 1 200th range. Some even go up to 1 250th of a second. And 1 1 25th, that's slow enough to where at f8, you're probably letting in a little bit of light. And so uh, think about that if you are considering purchasing this camera, because that could be a deal breaker for you if you have to have your lights on and you like to shoot at 2.8, or maybe you like to shoot, you know, at f2 or something like that. Uh, you definitely have to keep that in mind when you're shooting with this camera. If you're a Fuji purist who loves dials and buttons and all that, this is not really the camera for you. This isn't your X-T5 transition or your X-T4 transition. This is like your X-H2, X-H2S transition. And so if you're used to that PASM feel, you'll be at home with this, but that's something to keep in mind is that you don't get that kind of nostalgic Fuji feel with this camera. It definitely operates more like a traditional PASM camera. In terms of size, it is noticeably larger, but manageable. It's definitely larger than my Canon R5, which I have right here. Uh, definitely my R5 is more comfortable in my hand than this camera is, but it's very small, the difference, and it's very manageable. I took this guy out uh, on a trip to the American Southwest. I shot plenty of landscapes with it, and uh, at no time was I uncomfortable using it. At no time did I feel like I had to put it down. It's not like operating a gigantic medium format camera. And keep in mind that this is medium format, but it's 33 by 44. It has that crop factor of 0.79. So when you're looking at lenses like this 45, you multiply that by 0.79, it's basically a 35 millimeter. You take something like this 63, you multiply that by 0.79, it's more or less a 50 millimeter, a normal field of view. So that's something to keep in mind if you're looking at the lenses. Speaking of lenses, the one you see attached to it, the 110, it's basically equivalent of a 90 millimeter. It's an F2 lens, very beautiful. Also keep in mind that F2, yes, that's a light transmission thing, but with medium format, you are going to get a more shallow depth of field. So if you're watching this video and you're like, hey, why do the lenses only go to f2, f2.8? Keep in mind that those are more shallow depths of field. And because these are larger pieces of glass you have to build, they can only get it so far without it becoming ridiculously impractical to use the lenses. So uh, Fuji does have some 1.7 lenses, but if you're expecting a 1.2 lens in medium format, I mean, you're gonna have to carry that thing in a freaking case, like one of those bazooka lenses, like a 600 mil or a 1200 mil that you would get on full frame. And that's why Fuji hasn't made it yet, because it would be stupid expensive and the audience would be 
really small and this is a niche camera. And so that's something to keep in mind as well. It's a niche camera. And so they already don't sell a lot of units due to price. And so if they start making niche lenses for niche cameras, which I guess they're technically doing with tilt shift, uh, they're not gonna sell a lot and they're gonna be incredibly expensive. In terms of build quality, it does feel robust and stout in the hands. But unfortunately, my experience with Fuji is that their bodies just aren't on par with Canon and Nikon and Sony. I experienced this firsthand when I took my X-H2 out into a downport and it died. To the feel of my hands and the look of my eyes, the GFX appears to be made of the exact same materials, so that gives me little to no confidence using this out in the elements. Additionally, both my X-H2 and my GFX have had paint in corners start to wear simply from my hands. We're not talking about bumping this into things, we're simply talking about daily use. So with that in mind, that's an area where Fuji, in my opinion, falls massively short of their competition. I was initially concerned that there were no Type B slots in the dual card slots, but I found that using nice Sony tough cards, my experience using the dual card slots has been just fine. One place where I was massively disappointed with this camera is that you really can't use it for outdoor weddings. I tried to use it at a wedding in Texas in July, and I barely made it to the flower girls walking down the aisle before the camera started giving me overheating warnings. Yes, you heard that right, overheating warnings on stills. Now, I have seen in forums that there are some wedding photographers who use the GFX, but keep in mind it's likely geography dependent, and of course, any wedding photographer who takes their job seriously probably owns two of the same camera, so think about your pocketbook trying to buy two of these. Overall, I don't like Fuji menus. I don't think that they're laid out very well compared to other brands. I don't like the fact that sometimes I have to go through six pages to get where I wanna get. I like uh, menus like what Canon has, where it's once you get to the bottom of the page, you move over to the next tab, you go to the bottom of the page, you move over to the next tab, because everything is in front of you. It's not buried anywhere. You don't have to scroll down, pass beyond what's on the bottom of your screen. I just think that Fuji could do a little better as a company uh, developing menus for all their cameras. Now, the number one thing that annoys me about this camera is just look at how exposed that sensor is. I think it's like a 60% larger sensor than a full frame camera. That is very large and that's a lot of real estate. You got 33 by 44 millimeters there and that's pretty large, it's a dust magnet. And on that aforementioned American Southwest vacation that I talked about, I actually had a bead of sweat fall from my, my head and it hit the sensor. Now it doesn't technically hit the sensor because there's a little piece of glass in front of it, but I didn't have any wipes with me. So I took a ton of pictures of the Grand Canyon with a gigantic bead of sweat on it that I had to go in and fix in Photoshop. And that was a gigantic pain in the ass. So Nikon on cameras like their Z8 and Canon on cameras as cheap as their APS-C sensor R7, when you turn the camera on, you see the sensor. When you turn the camera off, there's about a second, and then it turns off. There's a little window that goes in front of the sensor. And to me, that's a no-brainer. And for a sensor so large, uh, like that Fuji GFX, it's even more of a no-brainer. And for people who are spending premium amounts of money on this camera body, which by the way, I guess now that they have the GFX 100 Mark II, this is the perfect time to buy your GFX 100S used because they are getting considerably cheaper. Uh, you know, a $6,500 camera new, I'm starting to see these things in the $3,000, $4,000 range on the used market. So uh, if it were me, I would go get a used one because a lot of people who shoot on these don't take a lot of pictures on them for some reason. I buy a camera to shoot on it. But to that point, like just the fact that the sensor is so exposed, I think that that is a boneheaded move on the part of Fuji. And I was very disappointed on the new GFX 102 that they didn't put that in there. Like, come on, man, it's a $6,500 camera. And at that point, it's actually a $7,500 camera and you have no way to protect the sensor. I just think that uh, Fuji customers deserve better. And I would like to see Fuji uh, implement that in future versions of this camera. So we've gone over the things that I love about the camera. We've gone over the things uh, that I don't like about the camera. So what are my final thoughts? My final thoughts are this. This is a niche camera. Uh, if you shoot it, understanding that you're going to get some misses. And now, obviously, landscape photographers, you have a tripod and you set up and you're probably fine. But I'm talking about people who use it for autofocus. The autofocus on it is mediocre at best. Uh, it's pretty bad. I guess for medium format, it's good. But if you use APS-C or full frame, uh, the autofocus on this might actually drive you crazy. So you just have to live with your misses. Of course, you delete your misses because the file sizes are so enormous. But this camera, uh, 
my best work was shot on it. So is all the pain in the ass of uh, the slow autofocus and the fact that I got to clean the sensor like once a week and all that, is it worth it? I think it is worth it. However, it's worth less than it used to be. Uh, buying this camera new, it's much less valuable now that there's a new version out and the new version has dropped the prices of the used version of this. And yes, I do realize that the GFX 100 II was not an actual replacement of this, but the consumers determine the market. And a lot of people who own this camera are ditching it for the 100 II. So you are what your market says you are. And so the 100 Mark II is a replacement for this as far as a lot of people in the market are concerned. So I say buy with confidence, but buy smartly on this camera. Uh, the pros definitely far outweigh the cons. A lot of the cons I knew I was gonna have to deal with. Some of them were still a pain in the ass, but just stuff to keep in mind if you're considering purchasing this camera. That does it for today's episode. I thank each and every one of you for watching. I hope you learned something about the GFX 100S. Obviously, this wasn't a detailed, in-depth review of all the specs. It was more of a, hey, let's reflect on work type of situation. But uh, if you like what you saw, tell me about it in the comments below. If you like this channel, I humbly ask you to click the subscribe button below. And if you like my content on this channel, you like my opinions on photography and videography related subjects, I highly encourage you to check out my other YouTube channel, the F11 Photography Podcast. And if you don't want to watch it and you just want to listen to it on your commute, you can always check us out on Apple and Spotify. And until next time, I'll talk to you soon. Bye. <laughs>